Hello, and welcome to Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell story, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. This week, we've decided to try something a little different than our usual format, because the number one question we get asked from our fans is about how to break into the entertainment industry. And it's an interesting question because everyone's answer is so different. So we've decided to go right to the source by asking some of our recent interview subjects who are all top industry professionals and their answers are enlightening mostly because they illustrate just how different everyone's pathway to success is in this crazy business. So let's start with cinematographer Sean Bobbitt who was nominated for an Academy Award for his cinematography on Judas and the Black Messiah. At the start of our interview, my colleague Stuart Bowling asked Sean how he got his start. And surprisingly, it didn't even begin in the film business. Hey, Sean, thanks again for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, I'm totally jealous you actually live on a boat uh, on the River Thames. That's just, that's just fantastic. <laughs> Um, let's talk a little bit about your background, um, how you got into cinematography, uh, because your background is a little different. Um, if we can talk about that. Yeah, it, it was basically a mistake um, from beginning to end. Uh, I, you know, as I was growing up, I had no idea what cinematography was. I was a really, really bad photographer. Even my best friends were really good photographers, and I used to go out with them and take photos, and they would literally laugh at me because of the, um, the poor quality of my imagery. Um, I was going to be a writer, um, is what I wanted, and then a writer-director. So I was interested in you know film and television, but mainly through the writing route. Um, but you know the, the world has a way of, of um, opening doors and closing doors on you. And I you know I basically, through um, through uh, poverty and desperation, um, ended up back in England as a as a, as a new sound man to begin with, um, just you know just trying to get a job anywhere I could, um, and, and did you know freelance sound for the American networks for about a year, um, which again I was um, I was uh, actually very very bad at. Um, and it was kind of suggested that maybe I do something else. Um, and I kept telling the networks, well, I can shoot. You know, I had I'd studied television producing and directing um, at the University of Santa Clara in California. So I did have a background and a basic technical knowledge. And in fact, my first job as a, as a freelance cameraman, I was 19, uh, doing industrial um, training films in the Bay Area. Um, so, you know, luckily the, well, not luckily, but, um, you know, the Falklands War arrived in 1982 and there simply weren't enough cameramen in England um, to, to cover it. So I, you know, they, they very reluctantly, CBS uh, gave me a break and moved me up to cameraman. And I did news for, for, for about 10 years after that, um, you know, which, which was great. This kind of, it was the last golden years of American television news where even as a freelancer, you know, you had a, a, an American Express card and could charter up to a 747 um, to get to wherever the story was, of course, with vice presidential approval. Um, so it was, um, you know, it, it was a fascinating time as well, the early 80s. Um, mainly, you know, it was just trouble everywhere. So it kept us very busy. Uh, and then after I got kind of bored with that and, 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 you know, also the, the news changed, um, with the, the deregulation of, of the American networks and the news in particular. So it's, I, it's, I, I sort of moved on from there then into the world of documentaries and, and did documentaries for about 10 years, very happily again, you know, traveling the world and, and mainly going to places where people were always very upset and shouting at us. Um, but it, you know, it was a, a, a fascinating, a fascinating training. Um, but all that time I was thinking, well, you know what, this is all great, you know, the grist for the mill. I'm going to write that great book. I'm going to write that great TV series. I'm going to direct a great film. This is all just practice. And, um, and I, I never really, 
you know, I was, I was interested in the job, of course, and I tried to do the best I could and, you know, trained myself really in, in you know, the cameras and lighting and, and imagery and, and actually had bought a, a an old um, Ari SR film camera and taught myself how to use film. Um, so, you know, I was carrying on with the te- all the technical stuff um, simply because, you know, I, was, I, I wanted to do a better job and, Slowly over time, I guess I did get a bit better, um, and then you know I, it's 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 interesting how how these the, the sort of random incidents that just knock you off in another direction. Um, I had one of my first jobs outside of the documentary world. It was for a new British TV series called um, Saturday Night at the Movies, a very low budget film um, thing, which which I. Um, you know, I was brought in to shoot, and the first the first day uh, was a complete disaster um, due to a lot of extenuating circumstances, and they fired me. And I had you know, never been fired off. Fired from life. your first job on your first day. <laughs> exactly. It was kind of distressing, believe me. Um, but what it did was it meant, because I had been looking at and just kind of thinking in the back of my head, I'd, I'd, I'd come across the International Film and Television School in Rockport, Maine, and had noticed that there was a cinematography seminar um, that Billy Williams was giving. And, you know, the day I got fired, I got home, I drank a bottle of wine, I phoned them up and said, have you got a place? And luckily, someone had actually dropped out that day. So, so literally, the next day I got on an airplane, I went to Rockport, Maine, um, and that week with um, Billy Williams changed everything. It was it was the most phenomenal. I mean, he's such a great educator, and just such a nice man, and so open and willing to discuss, you know, the the real nitty gritty of cinematography. And a lot of things just connected in my head in that week. And you know, I can remember you know, one morning just waking up towards the end and thinking, bloody hell, you know, I. I I need to be a cinematographer. I've actually been doing the right job in a way all this time without knowing it. And so, you know, when that was, when I had to leave, sadly I had to leave that, I came back to England and, and that was it. Desperately worked to, um, to change, which. So course, for those, uh, f- for those people uh, listening or watching who, who might not know, Billy Williams, he was the the director of photography on amazing movies like Gandhi and On Golden Pond and The Exorcist. And so what a what a great gift and an opportunity for you to to learn from from him, yeah. right? No. And just like I say, a very inspirational teacher. And you know, he made it all sound possible. And and so when I got back, that's what I did. I focused. It took me four years. To, to, to get my first even little sniff. In fact, it was, it, again, it was, it was just constant humiliation being turned down um, by everybody. And I think the, the lowest moment was, and it was literally two days before I, uh, I was given a break, there's a, a TV series here, it's not on anymore, called The Bill, um, which is about as low budget as you can possibly get, where lighting is, a, you know, a blonde bounced into the corner of the room um, and they turned me down. And at that point, I thought this, you know, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, I, would, I was really seriously considering um, becoming a fly fishing guide and moving to Alaska. Um, well, I, I, I will say, I will say wow. in your defense, as hard as the movie business in the U.S. is to is to break into, I think it's even harder in the U.K., <laughs> to get to get your foot in the door in the the film yeah. and television industry there, yeah, it's it's well it's, in those days in particular it wasn't it wasn't as big. I mean these days, thanks thank God for the American money and the American um, studios because um, they they basically finance all of our studios and and all of our filmmaking here. Um, but in those days, you know, you had a choice. It was BBC, ITV, Channel Four, yeah. Well, Channel 4 was only just starting. That's right, yeah, in the 80s, yeah. Yeah, so, well, no, actually, by the time I was doing documentaries, Channel 4, because I did a lot of Channel 4 documentaries, um, which, which you know, were great, the Dispatches series. Um, so, 
But, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of opportunity. And I was very fortunate. Um, Michael Winterbottom was, was crewing up for a film called Wonderland. And he was looking specifically for a documentary cameraman. And I had been um, referred to him. And, um, and after a lot of, um, you know, ups and downs, it, he, he gave me the job. And, and that was it. I'm very, very grateful to Michael for that because I've never looked back from that day. Many thanks, Sean. Next up, for all of you burgeoning animators out there, we spoke with Pixar Animation Studios producer Corey Ray and director Dan Scanlon about how they found themselves on the career path to making their Academy Award-nominated film, Onward. We have a lot of people in our audience who are students and they're kind of starting out in filmmaking careers. And so I kind of like to start the same way just by Dan and Corey, just asking you both sort of like, what was your career path? How did you get started in feature animation and kind of find yourselves as, as director and producer of, of feature animated films at Pixar? So I actually ended up uh, at Pixar in 1993 um, as kind of a fluke. Uh, to be quite honest, um, I uh, I did not go to film school. Um, I did a whole bunch of uh, various jobs. I actually majored in education and secondary uh, English and secondary education. And um, but I think what was amazing is I showed up at Pixar um, to be an assistant to the executive producer in our commercials group when we were still producing commercials. And um, it sounds a little cliche or, or, or woo-woo or something, but I literally, after being at the studio for about a year, I had a real aha moment that, um, that this was really where I was supposed to be and a place where kind of uh, talents and skills and, and passion that I didn't know I had kind of came to the surface. And, and um, so I didn't know I wanted to be a producer until I kind of understood what it meant in the Pixar world. Um, and so, uh, you know, so I just kind of, I, I dug in and, and I just, I literally fell in love. I fell in love with the medium. I fell in love with the people. I fell in love with storytelling um, and, and then, yeah, and have never left. 27 years later, <laughs> still there. That's amazing. Well, before, before we get, before we pose the same question to Dan, I just wanted to follow up. Corey, you said something about what it means to be a, a producer at Pixar. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What is the role of a, of a film producer at Pixar specifically? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's all I know, to be honest. Like I, I kind of know vaguely what, uh, what live action producers and producers of other mediums do, but I, for sure I can speak to what, what it requires at Pixar. And it's it's kind of it's really supporting and elevating the creative and 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 all of the people involved with uh, coming up with that creative and supporting the ideas and supporting the story um, in whatever that takes. So it's building the team. It's uh, it's very hands on. I would say you know producing at Pixar day to day is is very hands-on i'm in every single review i'm in editorial with dan i'm in the story room with dan um and then i'm also kind of making sure we have the right people that we need on our team uh i'm looking out and starting composer searches thinking about sound design thinking about marketing consumer products all of that outside stuff or outside the day-to-day -day. um but the the fun and the joy of, of producing at Pixar is that you get to really be hands-on and, and you're there watching the creation of these films from the very beginning. And um, it's, it's, really, it's really an amazing journey. Dan, what about you? How did you get started? Uh, I loved drawing growing up and um, went to... Uh, art school to study illustration and fine arts. And I had a very supportive uh, mom who got me into some of the, I'm from the Detroit area. And so she helped me um, meet up with other filmmakers and uh, film teachers in the Detroit area when I was young. So I was really lucky to find the animation and film scene there. And, um, and uh, got into working at a local company in Ohio 
as a um, storyboard artist uh, for a lot of the direct-to-video Disney sequels that came out in the 90s. And, uh, but it was a great group of people, um, and I learned a ton about uh, filmmaking and storytelling and so really started to get away from the animation part and get more interested in the storyboarding part and particularly the writing part. And as the now 20 years that I've been at Pixar, I moved away from storyboarding and got this great chance to direct uh, and, and to make with Corey Monsters University uh, because I had made a live action film on my own, like a feature film called Tracy, uh, just to practice, just to learn how movies get made. So I think the the storytelling part became the part I loved the most, the writing and the, the visual storytelling, as opposed to one particular facet of, of, uh, of animation. Thanks again to Corey and Dan. If you haven't noticed yet, film school can be one way to start in the industry. Other people just dive right in and start with entry-level positions and start working their way up. So don't ignore the small jobs because sometimes they can lead to very big jobs. In the case of producer Pei Lin Chow, they might even start in a pizza parlor. Let's hear how she and the other filmmakers behind the Oscar-nominated animated film Over the Moon, that's director Glenn Keane and producer Jenny Rim, found their way into the industry. The audience for our podcast, we have a lot of of industry professionals and and certainly because of the Dolby Connection, a lot of post-production professionals, but we also have a lot of uh, film school students around the world. And interestingly, I've come to understand uh, we have a really large uh, student uh, following in China, which is really fantastic uh, wow. for our podcast. Um, cool. So I'm, I, I always like to just kind of start off by asking for for each of you, just kind of a short, uh, what's your superhero origin story? How did you get started and what was your pathway to kind of where you are and what, what you're doing now? Um, Jenny, do you want to start? Sure. Um, my superhero <laughs> origin story uh, starts, um, well, in animation, I think it starts um, at my mom's pizza parlor. Uh, so uh, we, I grew up in restaurants and my mom um, had a pizza parlor in San Francisco and one day um, a man walked in and he said, I'm an animation director. <laughs> and, and we just casually just were talking about what he did. I didn't know anything about animation. Um, and uh, he happened to be looking for an assistant. And so um, I was they said, uh, you know, maybe you could go for an interview. So I did that. And it was my um, really entry point into animation. And I'm so grateful that that happened. But it's like the serendipitous moment where the fates are saying, you don't know, but this is going to like lead you for the next 20, 30 years in your life. And um, I worked with him for two years, about two years. And um, he worked for Wild Brain Studios um, in the Bay Area. And I learned so much about 2D and at that time 3D was starting and um, web animation. And it was just like kind of this amazing world where every day I walked in and I just was like surrounded by creativity, um, amazing artists, um, just fun. And I loved it and I never looked back. So that's, that's my, I guess, origin story. That's All, pretty amazing. Pizza. It always has to do with pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we, we start with cooking. I love this is going to be a, a theme for this uh, for this conversation. Uh, Glenn, how about you? I was uh, born into a family where my dad was a cartoonist, and um, when I was probably about nine, eight, eight or nine years old, um, I'd been drawing and just constantly loving everything to do with art. And at one point, Dad said to me. Um, when I was really little, he said, Glenn, I'm a cartoonist. You are an artist. And it was almost like he knighted me at that. I mean, it was the most wonderful thing I'd ever heard. And he gave me a book on dynamic anatomy. And I started really approaching classical drawing. And that was my goal, to be an artist. And so when I graduated from high school, I had these paintings and uh, drawings and I, um, we went to Cal Arts, where we heard that there was a school of many of the arts together, and 
um, to drop off my portfolio. And uh, the school happened to be closed because it was Easter break and we're driving around. And I remember just driving around near the, uh, the dorm <clears throat> and, you know, trying to figure out what we're going to do. We'd driven out from uh, Phoenix um, and uh, there was this kind of stoner guy walking across from the dorm and dad rolls down the window and says, uh, excuse me, young man. And I'm thinking, dad, what are you doing? He says, yeah, man. He says, look, the, the school's closed. Uh, yeah, the school's closed. That's right, it's closed. Look, my son wants to go to uh, the art school here. Here's his portfolio. Can you drop it off when the school opens? And dad gave him all of my original artwork and everything. <laughs> and the guy says, sure, man. And he, he walks off. And we drove back home. And I would never do this to my kids. But um, dad was very trusting. And uh, then a month later, I got this acceptance letter from Cal Arts saying I was accepted into the school of film graphics. And I'm like, what is film graphics? This is 1972. I had no idea. And I was like, that idiot, he dropped it off at the wrong school. And when I got there, that was the only way I could go to the school. I discovered it was a fancy way of saying cartoons or animation. And so I was an artist determined to be an artist, but it was going to be in the field of animation. And I discovered that animation really is the ultimate art form. I mean, it it will demand everything that you can put into it. I, I really believe if Rodin or Michelangelo was alive today, they would become animators and push it in some wonderful new direction. And, and that's the path that I want to follow. Uh, the thing I love about that story is, uh, you know, your career path, almost, it became like a bonding thing between you and your father. That's such in contrast to, I think, a lot of the uh, people who end up getting in the film business. And it's sort of like they almost do it in opposition to their parents who think they should become a doctor or a lawyer or something practical. Yeah, it, it sure meant a lot to have that model and encouragement. And I draw on it to this day very much. So, yeah, yeah. Palin, how about you? When you were a, when you were a, a young girl, did you dream of being a film producer? I did not know this was something one could do for a living. So speaking of doctors and <laughs> that path, um, I have eight cousins and all of them, with the exception of me, all of them are either MDs, PhDs, or MD PhDs. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and um, I had the good fortune of going to college at UCLA. So I was in Los Angeles, kind of like in the thick of it. And for um, a class I had there, you were to go out in the world and get a real world internship. Um, and I ended up uh, on the Warner Brothers lot uh, at a television show called Life Goes On. And um, as the intern there, it was my job to sort and read all the fan mail. And one of the amazing things about Life Goes On is that it was the first time a character with Down syndrome was ever featured on television. It was the first time an HIV positive character was ever featured on television. And the fan mail was so many people writing in about how this show was absolutely changing their lives and making them feel seen and making them feel understood. And I was hooked from that moment of, you know, just having this very serendipitous opportunity where I got to see in such a firsthand way the impact um, that film and television can have. So that's kind of what really drew me in. But I have to share um, what drew me specifically to animation because the story involves Glenn Keane. <laughs> and that is that um, when I was at UCLA, I went to a theater in Westwood and saw The Little Mermaid when it came out. And in the moment where Ariel seeing part of your world and reaches out at you, from the screen, I had like a complete 
out of body moment like i can't believe i am watching this this is happening right now i have to do this i i need to be a part of animated films and um so um i was fortunate enough that after i graduated um i actually got a job at disney um at first at touchstone and then at disney future animation um and so then of course um working on this film with Glenn is like a full circle lifelong dream come true culmination of my animation journey. So, so great. That's a great, that's hey, a great Lynn, story. I'm so happy that, that I was trying to reach out to you in the audience. I just happened to be in the form of Ariel. Right. <laughs> we did connect. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks Palin, Jenny and Glenn. And thank you to Ariel, the little mermaid who brought these talented folks together. You never know, maybe the filmmakers behind your favorite movie will one day be your future collaborators. We'll wrap up this week with the Oscar-nominated sound team behind News of the World. You don't get much more successful than this particular team. Oliver Tarney just celebrated his fourth Oscar nomination with this film, Mike Prestwood Smith his second, William Miller his first, and John Pritchett his third. Yet they all started from the exact same spot as aspiring film professionals. Or did they? As it turns out, many of the folks who work in film sound actually got their start in music. Just to kind of kick things off, I I wondered if we could just take a couple minutes and 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 let each of you just give us a little little bit of a glimpse about how you got started in the business. Did you guys all did you dream of being sound men when you were when you were little kids or how did how did this whole journey start for you? Uh, Mike, let's start with you. Well, I think with, like with a lot of people, it starts with music, really. Um, I, you know, fell in love with music as a kid and wanted to get into bands and recording and just fell in love with the whole sort of studio vibe, really. And, uh, you know, inevitably got into sort of the post world through the studio connection and uh, I always loved movies. I remember as a kid, you know, going to the cinema with my dad and just loving the whole thing. Um, I guess it was just... I ended up as being the default sort of producer in my band, you know, and I and I and I was just I, I was the guy that stayed late pressing the buttons, you know. And uh, I think that's if you're starting out, it's just you. That's what you've got to do is just you know put the hours in and learn your craft. Yeah, absolutely. And where, and where did you did you where did you learn about sound editing and sound design? Did you study that in university or how did that come about? That's weird. I actually, as a kid, I lived in New York and I I actually studied at the New School of Social Research and did a load of studio electronic stuff and sampling. And it was at the time when digital was just just kicking off. And um, when I returned back to the UK, I sort of had all this knowledge of all these synths and samplers and all this stuff where, and and no one really had that at that point. It was really early days. So uh, I, I, I actually got into post because I ended up using a sampler to do some sound design stuff on some commercials. And suddenly that was like, hey, we can use a sampler to sound design. You know, it was that long ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's how I got into it. Cool. Oliver, what about you? Hearing that from Mike, you know, I had a, a similar kind of thing as well. Just starting out in music originally, um, I was songwriting. I did have a publishing deal for, for a little bit. And then um, um, a friend, uh, the family did... Uh, he supervised foreign versions on movies um, and asked me to help out on uh, when he was busy. And, um, you know, it's one of those things that after a year or two, you realize you're doing more of that than music. And um, you start realizing, even though I didn't want to, to do that long term, part of that job is reverse engineering what they've done on big Hollywood films. And, um, you know, that I really that piqued my interest in that. And I kind of tried to just start moving over and um, same kind of thing. But, you know, just like Mike said there, you know, this was, I guess, my first jobs in sound editorial were on a Wayframe. There was no plugins, obviously, like you have now. You don't have access to, to everything that you'd have now. So to have a, an Akai sampler on the end of the desk that you can use that nobody else in that part of the industry was familiar with or outboard reverb units, out, outboard um, delay units that um, that we were very familiar with in music um, gave you an upper hand in some ways. You still, you had to play catch up on the narrative use of sound in a, in a project, but in terms of the sort of technical ability of trying to create something new, um, you definitely had an advantage. So um, yeah, just over time, it kind of, you sort of drifted into it, but um, yeah, I always loved film. So it was something that, um, yeah, it was uh, yeah, a fun thing to get into for sure. 
Excellent. William, how about you? Yeah, so um, again, music was my kind of background, playing in bands and then being that guy in the band that wanted to uh, record and produce those those uh, those tracks and stuff. So I was very fortunate, had a kind of home studio growing up as a kid. Um, and I went to study um, music production at a, uh, a university um, in Liverpool called Lippa. And um, yeah, with the full intention of coming out, wanting to sort of engineer and mix, produce music. And two two years into that three year course, um, there was a sound design for TV and film module, very sort of short module on the course, but designed to you know kind of introduce you to that world of post production for those that might be interested. Um, I think we had to if I remember right, we designed uh, we, uh, it was like uh, you had to take a, a clip from Monsters Inc and redesign it from scratch, you know, do the ADR, all the sound design, all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, I kind of didn't really haven't really looked back since then. Um, I sort of made a very uh, quick decision at the end of that second year to focus all my efforts on on post production. So I've spent the entirety, or well, the rest of the the uh, you know year and a half I had left after that, just focusing everything on uh, wanting to you know get into post production and and sort of you know mixing in that in that field. And uh, yeah, so following that, I uh, you know did did what everyone kind of does when you come out of university and looking for that first job, whether it's an assistant or a runner at a post facility kind of thing, and um, ended up getting a role as an assistant at Twickenham Studios, which is where I work now. And over the last few years, I've kind of been working my way through initially as a as a, an assistant and then a mix tech and now and now a recording mixer. So that's kind of my my way in. John, you're the uh, you're the uh, the outlier uh, on the team. You uh, mean the oldest the- guy? No, no, no. Being the production sound, have you actually even been in the, in the same room with with any of these guys yet? No, sadly. And apparently we're not going to have that pleasure at the Oscars either. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see what happens. So, John, how did you get started uh, doing production sound? A lot the same ways. Uh, I, uh, I started off as a drummer, you know, a musician's best friend. And uh, so I <laughs> played in a band, a little band that I was in. We got this bogus recording contract with some fly-by-night studio in downtown Dallas and they gave us all the time we wanted from midnight till dawn it just didn't give us an engineer and so I wound up you know they, they figured out how to record the drums and then I go back and record everything else and we just kind of went that way that's how I learned a lot and then I met a lot of the recording engineers in the city and learned it all from them really uh, I didn't go to school for it um, and then that just progressed to the one of the guys the band and I formed a recording studio in Dallas and a, a nice little, little studio. And we just did all kinds of stuff, jingles and, and records and whatever we could do. Um, I actually got credit for recording the vocals on the first platinum single ever given on a song I know, all of you know by heart, <laughs> uh, Johnny Taylor's uh, Disco Lady. No? <laughs> anyway. Um, that's how I kind of did it. And then, and then at some point, uh, we kind of went our separate ways and I went freelance and I tried to do all the things I said I could do. I was a cameraman, you know, and lighting stuff, all kinds of things that I directed a lot of them. And I just waited to see where I got the most work. Uh, I found a banker in South Dallas who said he was, he was tired of doing second mortgages and used car loans. And this sounded kind of exciting. So he loaned me a bunch of money to buy the equipment. Uh, and I, I, that, that's where I went. Like that. What was the first movie that you recorded uh, production mm-hmm. sound for? A movie that thank the gods never never went to the theater. Exactly, it was a movie it was supposed to be a sequel to the Ballad of Josie Wales. It was called The Code of Josie Wales, uh, and it was everything that could go wrong in a movie. Ever since, what happened on my very first picture, I, it's hard to describe all the terrible things that happened. But the best part of it was, it seemed like it was going to fall apart because about two weeks before we were supposed to shoot. The producer, who is the brother of the director, absconded with several hundred thousand dollars. And I thought, okay, well, there's a sign. Uh, I, I told them I would do their movie, but I, I'm sure I'm going to get out of this. So I went to them and said, okay, I'll do your movie, which they shortened the length of it. Yeah. I said, I'll do it, but only if I get paid in cash up front, knowing they would go, no, we aren't going to do that. Next day, literally, brown paper bag with hundred dollar bills rolled up in it for the whole five weeks I was stuck so I uh, did my first movie and went into lawsuits and all kinds of things and it, it never made the theater 
That's a great story. I love that story. <laughs> Thanks again, Oliver, Mike, William, and John. We hope that you found these discussions as inspiring and eye-opening as we did. As you can tell, there's no one way to break into the film business. But the one thing that all these stories have in common is how each required perseverance and an ability to take advantage of the opportunities as they present themselves, even if the path forward isn't clear. After all, you never know where your next gig might take you, or your first one. If you found these conversations helpful or enlightening, please let us know. You can find me on Twitter at Glenn Kaiser, or even better, consider leaving us a rating and a review on the Apple Podcasts app. It really helps raise awareness of our podcast so that we can continue to grow. If this episode's subject matter is popular enough, we just might make this a recurring series. Until then, thanks again for listening to us. This has been Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry. Production support by Taylor Hines, and our production coordinator is Tristan Enriquez. Thanks for listening.